Um, up first in this presentation series is Dr. Jeff Korntassel. Um, Dr. Korntassel, I think he can see you guys in the audience, but he cannot see me. I hope that you can hear me, Jeff. Um, he is going to be doing a presentation entitled Land Back as Indigenous Governance, Regenerating Resurgence and Indigenous Internationalism. Dr. Jeff Gonohalado Korntassel is a writer, teacher, and father from Cherokee Nation. As, as a professor in Indigenous Studies at the University of Victoria, his research and teaching interests focus on everyday acts of resurgence and the intersections between Indigenous resurgence, climate change, gender, and community well-being. Jeff situates his work at the grassroots with many Indigenous-led community-based programs and initiatives ranging from local food movement initiatives and land-based renewal projects to gendered colonial violence and protection of homelands. He is currently completing work for his forthcoming book on sustainable self-determination, which examines Indigenous climate justice, food security, and gender-based resurgence. Calling in all the way from the West Coast is Dr. Jeff Korntassel, and please give him a round of applause. Wado Benny, thank you. Osio Nagata, uh, Jeff Ganoholito Korntassel Dagwadoa, uh, so it's an honor to be here. I'm on the unceded uh, homelands and waterways of the Lekwungen and Wasainich peoples. Um, Wado, Benny, for organizing this and inviting me to be a part of this important conversation. And uh, so I'll, I'll launch right in because I know our time is short, um, but really thinking about land back as indigenous governance is not so revolutionary. Uh, but I, I always start with the language, with the Cherokee language. And I spoke to a couple of really, um, uh, you know, intense uh, speakers and, you know, that, that know the language really well. I'm not, I'm not fluent myself. And so I was, I was thinking, you know, what is land back and how does it translate into Cherokee language? We can't really say dirt back or soil back. It doesn't make sense. And so the closest equivalent that we could come up with was Oganasa uh, Dila Isti Aguaduli, which means I want to return home. And so when I think about the ways that we talk about land back, it's really about returning home. It's about returning to those places that nourish our spirits, that that promote our health and well-being. And of course, it's no accident that 80% of the world's biodiversity thrives under the, uh, I guess, the caring eye of indigenous governance. And so, you know, it's no accident. It's it's the ways that we've managed these uh, these territories, these waterways for generations and the ways that we renew those relational responsibilities. So I think uh, an important part of this, you know, some people think uh, or misconstrue land back as being some sort of possessive individualism, uh, maybe, you know, a return to ownership. But I think Leroy Little Bear, uh, elder and, and um really uh, amazing thinker from Ganai First Nation, talks about it as the land having agency. And so uh, he said in the past, how would you reckon, how you recognize the land is not as important as how the land will recognize you, right? It's the land that recognizes us. It's the water that recognizes us as having relationships to it. Uh, it's not about possessiveness. It's not about control. It's not about coerciveness. And so I think that's an important part of when thinking about our governance and thinking about the ways in which we um, enact these, these self-determining authorities. When I think of land back, uh, you know, this is, this is us, uh, this is Woody Hansen, who's a Cherokee storyteller, uh, basically caretaking his land, uh, caretaking the, uh, the waterways of the Cherokee Nation and we're gigging for crawdads in case you're wondering and you know i think about it's it's really enacting those protocols putting those stories and those protocols back onto the land uh and so in a short way it's regenerating indigenous la laws on indigenous lands and waters 
it's it's really uh, consent based jurisdiction, as uh, Hayden King and Sherry Pasternak have talked about in their land back report from Yellowhead. Um, it's it's really if we were uh, thinking about it in a really short way, uh, it's stories back, right? It's putting those stories back onto the land um, and regenerating those protocols and renewing those responsibilities that we have to place. I think the other way to think about this is a lot of a lot of phrases are are used in different contexts. So restoration, for example, uh, reclamation, uh, stewardship, uh, climate action, even resurgence. And I think these can all be seen as dimensions of of governance. And so oftentimes the the governing aspect is masked. Uh, you know, we're seen as protesters when in fact we're really protectors of indigenous lands and indigenous waters. And so these terms can sometimes mask the, um, uh, the ways in which we govern and the ways in which we have governed for, for thousands of years. As an example, I think a, a really creative example is from a, a a good friend, Carrie Newman, who's a Kwakwakwiak and, and Stalo artist uh, here on the West Coast. And he came up with something called the Seedling Project. And the Seedling Project is really quite simple, but it's it's really quite um, powerful when you start to think about the, the longer term ramifications. Uh, you have to find a place. Uh, in this case, where he's advocating for the University of Victoria to find a place to plant a seedling or more, one or more. Uh, and then an artist, uh, an indigenous artist will draw up a kind of a mock-up of a pole that will be carved from that, from that fully grown cedar tree uh, when it reaches maturity. And then you have to care for that tree uh, until it reaches maturity, which can be upwards of 600 to 800 years. And so the the way Carrie describes it is the seedling itself owns the land or or is is protecting that land. And so who is protecting the seedling? who who how do you enact rather than a five year plan, how do you enact a 600 to 800 year plan for the protection of this uh, of this uh, cedar tree? And so that to me is is extending our time frame for thinking about land back or or even this idea of returning home. Uh, it's it's challenging us to think about how will we caretake the land 600 to 800 years from now and also putting that responsibility to not just indigenous nations, but uh, to other people in terms of their care for these um, these plant nations for the animal nations, for the more than human relations that are an, such an important part of our, um, our kinship networks. Uh, Leanne Simpson has talked about indigenous resurgence uh, quite extensively, so I won't, I won't go too deep into this, but um, you know, it's, it's clearly about that attachment or the reattachment of our minds, bodies, and spirits to those networks of relationships and what uh, Glenn Coulthard calls grounded normativity. Uh, I've I've begun to look at these things in just four ways, four ways in which in resurgence is uh, is vital. And one is uh, turning away from the state, and so really decentering the state from our everyday lives. Uh, the second is generative refusal, so building on Otter Simpson's work. So where we outright refuse to allow encroachment onto our homelands and waterways. Uh, the third is making states redundant. That is uh, through our governance, through our, our uh, restoration of the land, if you will, uh, and those, relation, those relational responsibilities, uh, we make the state redundant. We make the state unnecessary. And then the fourth is rematriation thinking about how to reclaim the sacred on these spaces. So I'll, I'll go fairly quickly through this because uh, I have about 10 more minutes, uh, but um, just wanted to give you kind of the broader picture, the way I'm thinking about resurgence. 
I think another important feature of this uh, is the land body connection. And a lot of folks have written about this. Um, you know, think about, um, you know, the ways that uh, indigenous feminists have, have talked about the importance of land body connection. And, you know, uh, this is a quote from Nick Estes, uh, but also with pictures from uh, from Wet'suwet'en. And this is when Frida Houston was arrested in 2020 uh, by the RCMP. Uh, but like the land itself, the bodies of indigenous women, girls, trans, and two-spirit people are often see, are also seen as open for violence and violation. Uh, what happens to the land also happens to our bodies and vice versa. What happens to our bodies also happens to the land. Uh, extractivism, uh, violence, uh, the violence of man camps, for example, or industrial camps are very real in terms of the increases in assaults on indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit and, and queer bodies. Um, and in this case, this was, and you can see the brilliance of, of the thinking of, of Frida and others, this is the rest of, of 12 women doing ceremony. And the brilliance of uh, the RCMP having to walk by all of these red dresses, which symbolize uh, or signal uh, murder and missing Indigenous women. And they had to cut through literally reconciliation. You can see that on the bridge there on the Wet'suwet'en Kwa River. Um, but land and body are connected. And so when we think about governance, we have to think about it in its, its broadest sense. Uh, Melissa K. Nelson from Turtle Mountain uh, has a uh, has an important uh, kind of set of articles and and ways of thinking about rematriation. But here are just a couple of of those thoughts or those ideas. Rematriation is the centering of of indigenous women's knowledges and practices as keepers and stewards of intimate relationships with the elements, plants that should be plants and animals that give life and elevate indigenous feminist values and indigenous women's leadership as land stewards and guardians of kin. And that is uh, really uh, such a vital part of indigenous governance. And we can't, uh, we can't um, decenter that. That needs to be at the center of our discussion. That needs to be at the center. And um, I guess ultimately the, the guiding force behind our notion of self-determination and governance. And there's also uh, multiple acts of refusal that have been taking place since really since, uh, you know, for the last 500 years of colonization, ongoing colonization. This is just one example on New Hulk territory where New Hulk uh, peoples violated or, um, excuse me, evicted uh, a mining company from their territory and saying it violated New Hulk law. And this to me epitomizes this idea of regenerating indigenous laws on indigenous lands. Uh, we could think about the uh, eviction of coastal gas link, for example, by Wet'suwet'en. We could think of all sorts of uh, different examples where uh, this refusal is actually creating and opening up space for um, resurgence, but also for our governance to fully flourish. This uh, uh, piece on the left is Indigenous Resistance Against Carbon. It, it came out in 2021. And I actually think it's a, it's a really important um, document and study because what it showed, it showed what I think we all know, but uh, sometimes you need to be reminded. Um, it showed that basically Indigenous resistance movements um, led to the reduction of, of CO2 emissions. So indigenous resistance, i.e. protection of our territories, uh, if we really keep in, in, um, keep in, in keeping with the theme of this talk, indigenous governance reduces CO2 emissions. So indigenous governance is all about climate action. And uh, it's the protection of those homelands that is, uh, are actually the at the front lines of climate uh, protection and climate action. 
other examples uh, indigenous of kind of indigenous internationalism or the ways that we make the state redundant as indigenous peoples, the ways that we enact our protocols and principles as indigenous nations um, to transcend the state. And this is just one example, but the uh, the, the Treaty of um, uh, the Women, the Indigenous Women of the Americas, Defenders of Mother Earth Treaty Compact of 2015 is an important example, basically um, linking Indigenous women across the Americas uh, for a common goal of of protecting the um, protecting the planet, but also promoting uh, health and well being in their own communities. And it, these treaties are renewed through uh, annual acts of basically uh, climate action. Another good example is the Buffalo Treaty. I won't go too far into this, but Leroy Little Bear is, is definitely part of, of this important uh, treaty, which was designed to give agency to the buffalo and to enact the return of the buffalo to Blackfeet territory. In 2014, when it was first signed, it was signed by eight Blackfeet nations on either side of the U.S.-Canadian border. Uh, now there's upwards of 50 signatories. Uh, indigenous nations that have committed to honoring and protecting the buffalo. Closer to home here, uh, we can think about Camas or Quetlaw as an important part of the food sovereignty and food systems of, of the Lekwungen peoples. And it has been overrun by, uh, this is what Camas looks like here. These are the Camas bulbs. Uh, it's been overrun by um, invasive species like Scottish broom. And so the restoration in this case, uh, you know, Cheryl Bryce on the right there has enacted a Lekwungen community tool shed, uh, inviting indigenous and non-indigenous people to help pull invasives uh, so that the uh, camas or Quetlaw can thrive. 97% of the camas has been wiped out. And so the the road back is, is a tough one. It's a, a difficult one, but it's an important one. And so uh, she has enlisted um, multiple volunteers to go to parklands, places where she's often been excluded from, uh, even private property, and then, of course, the reserve as well, to regenerate this important relationship, but also to ensure that food sovereignty will be um, protected for future generations. This is just an example. This is a uh, Scottish broom uh, that we've re-gifted to the queen. Uh, this is what we've done uh, for a while now is putting the Scottish broom back onto uh, this uh, commemoration to the queen, kind of a re-gift, if you will. And another person who is um, really doing uh, groundbreaking work in promoting indigenous food sovereignty is Don Morrison from Chiquetmec uh, Nation, and she's enacted a, an Indigenous Food and Freedom School, uh, where in both urban areas and in more remote areas, uh, really protecting the salmon uh, and also honoring those, those relational responsibilities to protecting the plant nations and honoring those, those, um, uh, those food sources. My time is wrapping up here, uh, but I wanted to say that, you know, these places of resurgence are, are really uh, centered on reciprocity. Um, they're centered on indigenous led resurgence efforts and settlers are invited to uh, help create spaces of resurgence, but only at the direction of indigenous peoples, right? And not at the, um, and not vice versa. And I'll close with this slide of Nicholas Galanin. Uh, it's, it's a, he basically put a, a version of the Hollywood sign onto the uh, Kuila uh, landscape with this idea that uh, we can never forget. And so this was his version of land back is raising money for the return of this land to the uh, indigenous peoples of this territory. And I think, uh, you know, as indigenous people is an important part of our 
Uh, resurgence is remembering. It's remembering and acting on those remembrances so that future generations will thrive. So close there and uh, what do, thank you.